Let's look at the ribbon with tabs. The first tab on the ribbon is the scenes tab, which control aspects that affect everything within the scene. The mesh is the main mode in Gem 40, and the results from other modes are often saved into the mesh mode to enable access to specific uh, functions that's only available as meshes. For example, if you've got a mesh, you can do things like color code the mesh on elevation. You can color code the mesh on poly dip angle and so forth. There's a whole bunch of these functionalities that's only available as the mesh function. The next one is the markers that allows the coloring of points, simple block models and isosurfaces. So if I load a file and I've got some points in my scene, I can then go and make them spheres. I can, I can size them up. I can scale them on value as well. So at the moment you'll see when it comes up, it's color coded on elevation. That's by default. If I expand this grid just a small bit, you'll see what's needed is an easting northern RL and then as many data columns as you like. And as you cycle through your data columns, the data will automatically update according to the column that you have selected in the scene as well as the histogram down on the bottom as well as the statistical data on the right hand side. Just coloring the objects isn't the only thing that you can do. You can also press this ISO surface button which create a, a block model at the background and then you can have your ISO surfaces of these particular objects or the values on the objects. For those that doesn't know what an ISO surface is, it's just a, a contour within three dimensions. You can also then transport these colors onto meshes, but that will be discussed in a separate video. The next thing is mapping data. And mapping data is somewhat different from marker data because mapping data is looking for structural data. So there's more information required. You still need an X, Y, Z to show the location of the mapping structure, but you also need the dip the dip direction as well as the size of the object before it can be displayed correctly as a structural object. So let's load some data and this is the same data as before. The only difference in this case is and at the moment you see with the shape scale is still on three and that's why the points are so large. Let's make it one for the moment and then in this case you can represent this as a disk. You can, you can again scale it up to make it a bit bigger. You can also represent this as an arrow and that would be a dip angle arrow but you can also represent it as both we have got your dip angle arrow with the disc in the scene and what's nice about these ones the moment you bring them in you'll see there on the bottom you'll have a stereo net and a histogram of the column that well the histogram is of the column that you're investigating at that point and the stereo net would be from the structural information that you've got as well as the statistical data as we discussed before. The next one is drill holes and I'm not going to show an example in this particular case because it takes a while to create, to, to create the drill holes and follow the logic that I established but the logic in general would be you load your colors you then load your survey files to create a standalone file that I call a survey lines file which connect back to this lines option uh, in the top toolbar that we'll discuss in, f in a future video. And then you can also load your geotechnical information and create your technical lines files and from the lines files you can go and create composites which is like a points data file. You can also bring in lab data and you can also bring in structural data in one of two formats. But this is a specialized topic we'll discuss at a future point. The next one is images. And that's for all image imports and manipulations, such as draping of meshes onto our uh, draping of images onto meshes and so forth. I'll just load one example to show roughly what this could do for you. So over here I've loaded an OBJ file, and when you do these images as OBJ files, the shading that you've got affects the image quite a bit. So you can go to settings and you can maybe minimize the, um, uh, the shading effect to get a better image of exactly of the, of the exact photograph that you have taken. But images is something that we'll discuss in a future video as well. Then you've got all these settings and they have to do with the interface, the camera, the mouse and some scene modes. And we'll discuss these in detail coming up. 
Then you've got some external programs that is loaded or distributed with Gem40 and they contain functionality specific for Gem40, but I coded them as separate standalone executables. And the final tab is the help tab where you can open up a Windows Explorer window, you can look for updates or you can show the about window of Gem40.